Uh, yeah, that's your the, that's your British English name. <laughs> his name's really Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I normally use Alex because everyone here is, is difficult to pronounce Alejandro, right? And I I've been called different names <laughs> trying to pronounce. I, I don't mind really, but yeah, even in Spain, people call me Alex. So you're very welcome, and thank you for offering to um, talk with us this evening. Uh, maybe, maybe you could just introduce yourself, tell us a, a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, so I'm Alex Moreno, as I was saying. Um, I work as technical architect at the moment in, in Akia. Well, at the moment, it's been a moment of three years and a few months in, since I started with Akia. Uh, I've been in the Drupal environment or sphere, or whatever, however we want to call it, for 14, 15 years, something like that, a long time. Uh, as a software developer, I've been for a couple of decades. I just stopped talking about my age, I guess. <laughs> and yeah, that's that's pretty much about the interesting parts of myself. Everyone, everything else is, is boring. <laughs> and, and, and what does a, a technical um, architect working for Acquia involve exactly? Uh, that's an interesting question. I've been, like a couple of weeks ago, someone asked me to write an article about another colleague of mine, not, not on, on Akia, but on, on another company that he's as well architect. He's like, you know, I would love to see what is the transition, what is a technical architect normally do. So what we do, um, it's difficult to explain. It depends on, on every project, right? But pretty much we do things like assurance. We do things like uh, landing a project and see uh, the status of that project, trying to see where we can help the team. Normally we land on those projects. Uh, there are two different ways on, that we can engage with a partner or with a customer. One is um, it could be because the project is at risk and then the customer asks us to, to give the, the partner a hand or or the other situation will be in which we are partnering with uh, an agency and then we go as a, as a team and we go from beginning to end to finish a project, right? And it, we, we are normally like one architect on bigger projects, it could be two or three architects. I've seen even four or five articles, uh, ar architects. <laughs> um, uh, a project manager, yeah, Again, if bigger projects also have more project managers, or even a project program manager. And on these situations, yeah, we do more like a, a normal day-to-day -day work in which everything like from, from development to code reviews, normal stuff, right? So I don't do that much different to what I will do as a, as a developer, maybe more on the leadership side where you are more involved on helping and code reviewing and a lot of meetings <laughs> and yeah. I code because I still like and I enjoy, I guess it relaxes me, it stresses me to just have something simple that grab a ticket or have some problem and spend a few hours on that, but I don't have a lot of time on this role to do it, but I still do it. Interesting, thanks for that. And I understand you've, um, uh, you've also been nominated for the um, Drupal Association Board elections, which are ongoing at the moment? Yeah, so if you want to vote, and if you want to vote for me or for any other candidate, uh, it's, I think it started on Monday. Uh, if you go to the Drupal page, it, there should be, I will share a link, but there are 10 candidates. We have all of, the, all of us different proposals. Um, from my point of view, what I would like to see on the Drupal Association is uh, and that's from my interview, if you want to watch uh, the full interview with um, Rachel Lawson. I would like to see a Drupal Association which depends less on on companies and donations from from individuals, like right? Like what happened this year because of the of the pandemic, the Drupal Association had to go to everyone and ask for help because they had a huge problem. Normally the Drupal cons make make money for, for the Drupal Association because the Drupal con was not happening this year there was a huge hole on the finance and that's because the, probably we depend on a single source too much right so if we want to see the, the Drupal Association be more successful we have to find more ways of, uh, of be more sustainable and, and make sure that they are focused on on the things that are really important right or, or on their values unless on trying to survive another year 
Excellent. Well, uh, I'll be looking at the candidates myself, and um, I think you might have just dissuade me there. <laughs> so anyway, this evening, Alex is here to um, do a talk for us, which is based on, a, I think, a blog post that you wrote, uh, which was titled, Speed Up Your Local Development with a, an Old Remote Workstation. So maybe we should just hand over and you can tell us all about that. Yeah, I've already said I told to, to remember. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Can everyone see? Yeah. So, yeah, as you were saying, well, thanks, first of all, for inviting me to this, uh, to talk about this. Um, this is, as you were saying, uh, the, the result or the outcome of something I've been working on uh, for some time, and I thought, yeah, well, why why not publishing this in in an article? And I have to I have to put a couple of disclaimers. One is um, that was some notes that I was taking, and I was taking them for for some months. And I thought, okay, this could be an an interesting article. This was not designed to be an article; it transformed in an article. Now, it was not designed to be a talk, but it has evolved in a talk. Okay, so that's the first disclaimer. Second disclaimer is that in that door that you don't see, probably kids may happen. My daughter is just arrived downstairs. <laughs> it could, we could have some surprises, I hope. <laughs> it does, but sometimes it appears in the middle of uh, some meetings. I think you saw for that, um, uh, Richard. As I was saying, what I'm going to talk is about this. And I'm not go making any any joke between a known brand or anything and, and the speed of that brand, right? But I think it can affect any 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 laptop, any desktop. What normally happens, and uh, I don't know if it happens to me only, but for what I hear from other colleagues, it's, it's a common problem. You start with a brand new laptop and a new job. Um, happy days, everyone happy. The laptop is normally fast, but over time, happen things like this. Uh, whoa, I don't want to move to the next one. Uh, the, let's say that you are in 90, 100% of the, of the performance and everything looks like fast and uh, yeah, happy days. A year second, you probably don't notice and you are focused on other things. You don't, it's not a new brand new laptop anymore, but as time goes, there is some kind of degradation, right? On the, on the performance. If you will be working on Linux or if, normally you, you have a lot more flexibility to to tinker around to this to uninstall things to maybe even reinstall the whole system right you can also actually also, also do it with uh, windows or, or mac but um in general even if you do that you end up on on the same hole like it, i don't know if it's because we get more demanding resource demanding like in the past, we used to we used to have Apache and MySQL, and everyone was happy. Nowadays, we need to have whole environments with uh, Dockerized and systems, and we have heavy IDEs like PSP Stone that are amazing, and I love it. But every time I I switch it on, my computer looks like this. Right? I start PSP Storm, and everyone hears the jet engine going on, and looks like it's going to take off. And yeah, that's pretty much the problem to solve. How do we solve it? And that's what I was trying to, to do during the last months. Like um, I started in Nokia three years and something, and again, the computer was was fast, it was happy. 16 gigas was enough for everyone. Five years ago, eight gigas was enough for everyone, right? But uh, like a few months back, 16 gigas, but <laughs> it, was, it was frustrating. It was starting the computer, it was, uh, freezing, and I'm not talking about the temperature because everyone tells me that in Spanish and everyone, yeah, I'm always freezing, uh, even in summer. Um, but yeah, so what are the options when that happens, right? One, one of the options, and I like to, to put this uh, in context because what I'm going to show may not work for everyone because of these of this things, right? Because of the cost and on the effort. Uh, that equation, I think, is key. Uh, the, 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 sense, the most sensible thing will be the, the option one. We uh, we have a very low cost and very low effort, which means in terms of effort, we have to research. Uh, 
if we need RAM or if we need, if we have the option to put an, an extra processor uh, or an extra chip. Um, and then the cost is going to be one of the lowest because whatever it costs the, the RAM, right? Uh, MacBooks and these things are more expensive, but they still is cheap, right? However, this is not always an option, especially again, if you're working with Mac, if you're having a desktop, you just uh, buy a bit more or even a laptop, which is not uh, Mac, you just buy some extra RAM again cheap. The other option, the most expensive one, you just throw away the computer, you are fed up with this. Um, also a good de-stress de -stress exercise. Um, just throw it on, through the window and do a bit of um, research on, on what computer will work for you and you splash a lot of money at that, right? That's the easiest. It, it's not always the, the best option or maybe it's not always the uh, a possibility, right? As, as the previous, uh, as the previous option, and then uh, what they have on the right is the one which is the most cost-effective, trying to reduce everything we have, um, spending as less money as we can. But then the effort that we need to put on this is going to be the, the higher, right? And that also can be something that not everyone can afford. At the end, we are busy and we are with uh, tight agendas, um, and maybe for us it's going to be a better solution to spend the money or go and cry to our manager until they get tired of us and they buy a, a new computer for us. Um, these two options, as I was saying, the, the fourth, for example, the option of having a AWS, for example, or digital ocean is quite similar to what I'm going to show, uh, but it's a little bit less uh, on the effort side because it requires a little bit, a little bit less uh, of effort because we have things pre-configured for us when we buy any service, DigitalOcean or AWS, depending on the system, they are going to just give us the uh, pre-configured machine so we don't have to worry about some of the things that I'm going to show uh, in a second. And then the, the third option, which is going to uh, be this one. So what I'm going to do, or what I did a few months ago, is, okay, I'm completely fed up of this computer. This doesn't work. When I start Zoom and PSP Storm, uh, this is going to take off, take off. And it gets really hot, it gets really noisy, uh, it freezes, so what can I do? Uh, I did a bit of investigation, and that will be the first step for anyone doing, trying to do the, the same, the same step, right? Do some, some research. And normally we look for workstations. Uh, there are a lot of companies now struggling, so probably it's a good time to look for uh, refurbished computers, uh, company retired computers, things like that, right? Um, there are very cheap options, as you can see on the right. I wouldn't go to the cheapest. For me, what I was trying to, to find was the highest amount of memory, of memory or RAM memory, uh, because what I'm going to use this for is, is the, the most suitable, right? And spending as less money as possible. For example, the, the 11 pounds probably has four gigas or two gigas RAM and it's very old. So probably this is going to be more frustrating than my laptop at the moment, right? And this is the, the solution I or, or the, the thing I got. It is it was a relatively cheap solution. It's a Dell eight or ten years old. Uh, there are plenty available because this uh, was a very popular uh, workstation. So nowadays they are just sitting in a warehouse collecting dust. And you, yeah, you, you can find a lot of them at the moment. Probably well, this was six months ago, something like that. Maybe there are less now but maybe there are other options but you can always find depending on what you what you need you can always find options like this and again it depends on what you want to do right what i like about this is the extensibility of this um, the ram and the and the processor right if you look at the default option which is the one i i got it has 40 uh, sorry 24 gigas ram and that's for what i have at the moment that's more than enough, right? Well, I'm running sometimes a couple of Docker containers. Uh, sometimes I forget to stop one of them and I end up with three or four. And this just runs completely fine with this amount of RAM. Uh, if I get more, it's going to be just for the pleasure of, you know, having a faster car. But for me, this 24 is it's doing more than enough. Uh, when I was thinking about this, I was not sure if this was going to be enough. 
uh, well, I'm using 16 at the moment, so I was sure that this was going to be fine. But I was especially interested on, you know, if I spend a little bit more, maybe 20, 30 pounds more, I can get more. And even if I want to spend a little bit more, then I have a, I have a Ferrari on this, right? And the other thing I like about this option is that you could put another processor. I don't think I will, again, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe just for the sake of, but I, at the moment for what I'm using it, maybe if I use it for, for gaming, for example, which this computer is pretty good for that. Some people buy this for, for gaming. Um, you can still keep your partition with window and it has a nice Nvidia uh, chipset and it's pretty fast. So for something like that, I will uh, I will buy an extra processor. At the moment, I don't I don't game a lot, so just having enough RAM is, is more than enough for the use I I give to this to this machine, right? Okay, so drink um, alternatives, because not everyone. One of the things I haven't told about this is that this is. This is, it doesn't look like this big, but this is massive. It's just sitting next to me, and it's just half of the size of the height that I have on the desk, right? So I wouldn't even think about taking this on a, <laughs> uh, to work on a commute. I was not thinking about committing any way with this computer, but if I go to Spain, for example, that I sometimes do for a month or to work from there, um, people, I don't think I will be able to put this on the, on the plane. If I need some more flexibility or if I just, want a little bit less noise because it's also a bit noisy. These things are pretty pretty amazing as well. They are nooks. I don't know if everyone is familiar with this one, but they are mini computers. And you can find them very cheap as well for pretty much the same budget that they spend. But obviously the performance of this is going to be much less, right? So you can see here, we are talking two gigas, two gigabytes RAM with uh, 30 gigas um, hard drive. What I was looking for me uh, for this case is having something that is going to sit here. I don't mind. I work from home. I'm very well occasions I have to travel to customer. So it's totally fine if I if I cannot commute with uh, that beast. But yeah, for some people, something like this could be more interesting. You may want to sacrifice um, having some performance to have a bit more mobility, right? And if you want to have something like as performant as this, as you can see at the at the end, you can spend quite a bit of money, like 800 pounds easily on 16 gigas. The, now we are talking about serious money. We are talking maybe we should spend this money on a laptop or, or maybe not, right? Depend of, depending on of, uh, how, yeah. Maybe you want to use this as a, as a desktop. Some people, a lot of people actually use this, uh, like these computers as, a, as desktops. And another alternative would be something like this, but, uh, well, this is not really an alternative uh, because this is not designed to what I'm going to show here. It is more designed so to, to learn things like how do you deploy on, on production with uh, an, envir uh, an environment of cluster or a cluster of um, of uh, containers, right? Something like Kubernetes. Uh, it will be good to learn and to tinker in around that. And probably everyone here is familiar with the amazing work that uh, Jeff Gerlin has been doing on on, on this and learning us as well. And he's been stacking raspberries on this, but again, this is more uh, like this is not to use as a, a replacement of, of your rocker, right? The, the hard drive that these things have are lim limited, and as far as I understand, you need to make a full deployment on that. So you don't want to be working on your local, and in order to test that your changes are working, you have to do, be doing deployments to, to this thing, even if it takes uh, um, yeah, a few seconds or whatever, which I think it will take more than a few seconds. But anyway. The options are there. So, step zero. Um, I normally use Wi-Fi on my house, but on, on, in my case, the, the router is next to the, the TV on the first floor, and my office is on the third floor. So, one of the things that they started to notice is that when I was using the terminal, the um, performance of this thing in terms of network, it was creating a bit of lag, right? So when I was trying to do some commands on the terminal, it, it can get a bit annoying. And a cheap solution that they found for this for, was to, to cable from from the first floor. It's, it's, I think it's the limit is like something like 50 meters, something like that. 
So it was, I think I used 20 meters, something like that. And uh, obviously I had to spend a little bit money to buy a, a USB adapter to have this thing connected to, to my computer. Uh, but I would say another 10 pounds, something like that. So we are already talking about 120 pounds. Uh, I made a mistake to buy a Wi-Fi for the, for the desktop. So another 10 pounds, another 30, 130, 140, something like that. So this, uh, with this setup, uh, it made me happy. It made my wife a little less happy. <laughs> and every time my wife sees me with a, a hammer in the, in my hand, she starts to, yeah, to say, yeah, oops, because <laughs> I'm really bad at DIY. I, I, I still have to fix it. This is a picture I took yesterday. And, uh, this happened six months ago. I promised her that we'll fix it, so I completely understand that he gets worried once he sees that I'm doing, I'm starting to do some DIY. So all network uh, salt, or the step zero salt, so the things that you will need to do with this, and this is where, when we were talking about the effort and uh, cost equation, this is where cost is, relatively low, uh, effort can get a little bit higher um, because you need to spend a bit of time on this, right? If you are familiar with Linux, then you may just jump in whatever distribution you are more familiar to. But in my case, I'm familiar with Linux. I've been working my whole life and uh, my introduction to open source was thanks to, to Linux. With uh, I started with Debian. So, and that's one of the reasons I started with Ubuntu because it's a distribution that I'm, uh, because of Debian and I'm quite familiar and quite happy with uh, APT and all the environment around Debian. Um, the problem is this is another computer and Ubuntu is a pretty shiny new uh, distribution. So some things didn't work as I was expecting. Uh, first thing first, because this is going to be not a desktop, not something that I'm going to use initially. Uh, something to browse or um, to use Spotify, things like that. What I want is a distribution that is going to be as light as possible. So I could take two two paths. Take whatever, like Ubuntu or uh, SUSE or whatever uh, fancy distribution we want, and then we start removing things from that. Or the easiest option or the most sensible is start with something that is by default very light, like Ubuntu and you, you only install the things that you want, right? There are other distributions that is going to be even more lighter. I think Gentoo, I used to use Gentoo in the past, and, but that's a lot of effort because everything that you have to install on that, there are no binaries. You have to compile everything, right? And it's an amazing experience. You see everything being compiled and it takes hours to, to install this. But again, in my case, I need to do something fast or something a bit, a little bit quicker. So that's why I choose something that is like Ubuntu or uh, problems I had with Ubuntu and with Ubuntu, I don't know, for some reason, maybe this is an old computer and uh, from time to time after when I had to restart the computer or uh, my, my system got corrupted. So when I tried to start again, um, something with the boot loader uh, group was wrong and it happened two or three times and then I thought, okay, let's try something else. And that's where I tried, and again, something familiar as well with, uh, with Debian, which is Mint, and I'm pretty happy with this at the moment. Um, I haven't had any more problems um, because it's an old computer. And if you go to this option, you may have as well the same, the same problems that um, some distribution are more focused on, on desktop and uh, having the shiny thing, but they are maybe not that compatible with 10 years old computer, right? Um, we install the distribution. Next step is if you start lean, let's start uh, one by one the things that we need, right? I start, obviously, the first thing you need is SSH because the way I'm going to use this, I'm not going to have, oops, I'm not going to have uh, a keyboard and a screen on this computer. I want to work from my Mac and from my second screen, as I'm doing at the moment. And I just want to connect this as, as if it was a computer or a workstation connected somewhere else, which actually it is, right? This is an, an workstation after all. And this is the same for this. So this is, as you will see in a second, it's super fast. 
um, Docker, DDEV, Lando, whatever you want. Again, I will install only the basics because I have to jump normally between projects. Sometimes I need DDEV, sometimes I need Docker, sometimes I need Drupal VM, uh, Vagrant. Um, I have all of them installed. They don't take space at the, at the end. If I need to spin up a DDEV um, container, uh, it's, it's, it's there, sleeping, it's not taking space by itself, it just we will start taking resources the moment I I spin up the, the project, so that's that's fine. That for the purpose I'm looking for. Uh, another thing that you have to set up, and this is again the basics, is having a SSH public key for the simple reason that because I, I don't want to have to introduce the password every single time I'm connected to this computer, right? Uh, the computer, the laptop I'm working from is a trusted laptop, trusted. Uh, network source, so um, I have, I, and even if it is not using the public keys, it's a trusted way of connecting, right? So I really like the experience of just doing SSH against the, the machine, and bam. Um, a fixed IP as well. This is not difficult to to do, and it's just sending a couple of configuration files, and it will depend on the distribution that you are using. X Windows, that really depends on for. In my case, I configure this, but maybe if you go for an option that is a bit cheaper than this and you have a, you are a little bit more tight on, on resources, you can save like Windows, right? Because everything related to browse, you are doing it, you are going to do it from, from here, from your local local, from your real local. So that's an option for you. You could strip, or you could choose a distribution that doesn't have fixed Windows at all and you will save that, that performance. Or you could have it there sleeping, and, and in a case like this one on the T5500, uh, I don't notice any difference on performance. And yeah, making sure that uh, nothing else is running that you don't need as well a, a good a good thing to have in mind. You have tools like PS and HTOP that's going to tell you everything happening. If you are again tight on resources, I will look at those uh, tools. Um, you don't even need X Windows. You can do it from the terminal, and whatever you detect that that is running, and uh, you don't need it for what you are doing for the work that you you are doing. I will just uh, kill it, remove it, uh, uninstall it. And this is what I really like about Linux, right? You, you cannot do this with Windows or, or MacOS, even though MacOS is a BSD. Uh, it's a, such a black box, and you are not able to remove a lot of the things that you want. Like I, you couldn't remove. I don't think you could remove the X Windows on on Mac, right? So that's why going to Linux as well makes sense. Now, you need to do some basic setup on your local, which normally consists of having a host file because you have um, a fixed IP and that's the reason we are having a fixed IP. Uh, you can say, I want to, for example, have my uh, like uh, like you can see here, I have my local domain. I don't have to be remembering any any IPs, right? So that you do it having the remote server with a fixed IP, and then your host file having uh, having the IP pointing to that. There are some more sophisticated ways of doing this, which is using a local um, DNS. Uh, it's not a lot of effort involved in that, but honestly, this works fine for me. So. If, I, if you want to tinker around and learn a little bit how the uh, DNS service works, and I think it's an interesting experience. I've done it in the past, I don't need to do it again. Um, because you will need to be, or for this solution, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm mounting the file system on the remote server as a local uh, file system in my computer, in my MacOS. Uh, for that, you will need a OS X Fuse or Fuse. Um, I will show in a second how that works, but uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty easy. I think in the last versions of Mac, uh, you don't even need to install this. I had a new computer, funny enough, a few months after having to do all this setup from the company, and I don't remember I had to install a Fuse. But anyway, um, it's there if you need. If you need, and it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy. Just install the application, and it, what this is going to do is going to allow you to. Uh, do this SSHFS. Um, you and again, you don't have to remember IPs. You mount whatever folder you want, and you mount it in your local uh, folder, right? 
I will show in a second as well a, a, a bit, a small demo, uh, and everyone can see what uh, all this means. Things that I, I used to do before, but I keep doing it. There are some applications, even though I have a lot of memory now in my local, in my new, in my new laptop. Um, it's good to keep the house clean, right? So this application, for example, works quite well. Open, uh, clean, clean my Mac. I used to use another one. I don't even remember the name, but the other one I had to go to uh, the application itself and tell tell it to to clean the RAM, right? On this one, I really like it because every time you close Spotify or PSP Storm or this is, this is actively looking for memory that is not anymore in use and it notifies you that it's cleaning that memory, right? And obviously because now I'm not using Docker in this computer, I still have it installed, but normally I have it actually I have it here. I just realized that I have it in <laughs> I have it in installed in this computer, but I'm not using it. Um, I haven't noticed any performance issues, uh, but again, um, this is a new computer. When I jump into my old MacBook with 16 gigas, uh, this made a, a huge difference for me, right? When I tried to open Zoom, for example, on PSP Storm, I was in trouble. Again, the image of the beginning of a, a rocket trying to take off, right? Since I did this, I was keeping Docker and everything that I didn't need, and I could remove from my, from my Mac up to where Mac or Macos allows you to remove, and the performance, on performance-wise, it was this was uh, dramatic. Like I could use my computer again. Um, any questions so far? And then I can drink a little bit. <laughs> okay, I continue. So, what are the things um, you will need to to do on on the remote? On the on the local is is easy, right? You just keep things clean, uh, keep the basic stuff. On the remote, we have already talked about. Uh, you don't need Apache, you don't need MySQL, things like that. You remove them because I'm going to use DDEV, and I think it's or DDEV or Land or whatever. Um, I think it's more efficient in terms of you you can work on these things, and then if something breaks, you just remove it and restart the environment. Uh, if you are working with Apache or MySQL, uh, things get a bit more complex, right? If you mess up with something. Uh, you, it means that you have to, in, to invest a lot more time on fixing those things. But uh, again, that's a personal option, right? A, a personal choice. Um, I think most of the people nowadays is anyway on, on this on this same line, right? Using containers. Um, on the articles that they have on, on the internet, I will share this. Or uh, sorry, actually, it's on the on the Meetup link. I have instructions on how to configure the Lando and Drupal VM on how to share this because for, for security and for safety, normally these these uh, solutions are locked down. You cannot use them for serving internet or serving the services outside of that machine, right? And it's completely logical. However, for the case uh, that I'm working here, this is a trusted computer, this is a trusted network, the router in my house hopefully doesn't allow traffic inside. Um, and yeah, it's a totally safe option to open the ports and everything that I need to do um, on each one of them, right? With Lando and Drupal VM, it was pretty easy. It wasn't so much more difficult on DDF. I think I had to research a little bit more, but everything is on the article anyway, if anyone is trying to do this. Um, one of the reasons I, for example, I was mentioning in the beginning, you could go towards having the same setup, but doing it on a AWS, or digital ocean uh, environment, obviously that could be more of a problem because you are exposing services and containers that are not designed for that, right? So um, be careful with that. Now, I was talking about X windows. You don't necessarily need this, but this is something I, I thought, yeah, sometimes I use it for maybe I need to configure something that I cannot use from the console, from the terminal, but, yeah, I also have, if, if you really need this, you will probably, if you see my screen, my window here, you, I, I still have my, my keyboard here. I don't remember the last time I used it. Um, but if you need for some reason to connect to your desktop in a remote environment, it's probably because the, <laughs> the, the server or the workstation is in trouble, right? 
like the, what I was talking on the beginning, had some problems with the uh, with the. I don't know if it was the boat loader or something. It got corrupted, right? So there was no way that this was going to boot, and there was no way that it could connect hands via remote desktop, right? Um, I tried a couple of options, type DNC, it took me a bit of time to configure, and I end up, I didn't end up with the result, or let's say I did. I was not completely satisfied, right? Things like resolution or uh, the experiment itself of um, type DNC, maybe it was because I was using the um, default, how is it called, A screen sharing or something that is, is coming by default on Mac. Maybe it was more of a problem of the default application. I investigated a few other applications, but uh, or the have, you have to pay for them, or um, or they are not or they are following the same the same user experience, right? It was a bit frustrating. Um, and then I discovered Remote Desktop by Google, and this is pretty amazing. I will do a, a little a quick demo on this, but it gives you the closest thing that I've seen on a remote desktop. Uh, on, on an X window, right? Uh, I still wouldn't use this for, let's say, you could put your PSP Storm on this thing, on your on your workstation, and use your remote desktop like that, having your PSP Storm in, in that window. But what I found it is it gets a bit frustrating because you are used to your circuits and you use command tab to iterate between windows. Because you are inside a window, if you do that, suddenly you get confused because you are suddenly jumping on a different window that you were expecting, right? And then you realize, oh, shit, okay, I was inside uh, this window, then you need to use the alt. And the same goes when you try to copy something between here and there, right? So you could do that, but again, I, it doesn't give me the experience that they want of having a, a closest as possible local experience, right? So I, I want, uh, if I'm working with PSP Storm and and the terminal, I want to forget that I'm using a remote. I don't want to have to remember every time that I'm trying to copy a link or I try to copy a text or something that, uh, yeah, I want this to be as smooth as possible, right? So I can feel that I'm more productive. Um, if you went for something like this, you have more than power, more than enough power to maybe put some applications like Slack, Zoom, or things like that that don't require that much, uh, let's say, developer experience. Uh, yeah, um, that much interaction with me, right? I can have a Slack on on this window, and it's not too annoying. Uh, that is an it's an it's a remote. Um, that was something I used when I when I had the, the previous computer, the previous laptop, and I was a bit tight on resources. And even using the remote, this this uh, Dell workstation, even though I was using that, uh, having Zoom and Slack, it was still slow, right? So uh, I, at some point I moved my Slack to to the other computer and Spotify as well. So I kept everything as simple as possible. Zoom again, I even move it in there because if I have to share a screen, it gets a bit complicated, right? Then I have to be on the other one, anyway, yeah. Then, well, yeah, pretty much I've already answered why um, I'm using SSHFS and I'm using my PSP Storm as a, as a remote, as a local, in a remote uh, file system, which is locally mounted. This is getting like a riddle. I hope everyone is following. Um, I will show you in a second why, but SSHFS is not the best solution. It's working for me now, and sometimes it gets a bit annoying, but uh, not annoying enough. And I will show why. So uh, the problem is SHFS is not designed to be used as this. So when you make a change on the file system, it doesn't get propagated automatically or immediately to PSP Storm or to the file system on my log, right? There are other options. NFS, I think there are um, actually some solutions designed for this. But again, we come back to the problem of having time to do this and having the money to do this, right? I didn't want to spend a lot of money. But I also can't afford at this moment to spend a lot more time on this. Um, and actually, SHFS is working fine for me at this at this point. And I will show you some of the annoyances and how we how we how we go around that on my daily uh, on my daily work. 
Now, something I discovered quite recently is FIA, or FIA, or however you want to pronounce it. Some companies are using this to give you a remote IDE experience on your browser. Um, I will open it, and everyone can see what it is. If you look at this, it looks pretty similar to what PSP Storm is. And the experience is, is good. I've been using this because actually this is uh, what Akia is using as well for um, the Akia Cloud IDE, which is a new service that um, it allows you to connect to the Akia Cloud environment. And it allows you to, as you see here, code as in your local environment. Again, pretty much like what I'm trying to do here having a local environment, which is remote, but I'm treating it as, as local, right? And if you see here, it has everything that you need. It has your, your console, it has your... Uh, so theoretically, I could use this and install it in my um, workstation, and it's something that I have on the to-do list. But I'm very picky with my uh, ID. I like what I use. I like PSP Storm in this case. Sometimes I use Atom or... All, and although FIA is quite good, um, yeah, I haven't invested a lot of time because I'm, I'm happy with the setup, right? Another thing that FIA has, which is pretty nice, I don't think it's by default on FIA, maybe you need to spend a little more time, but on the case of uh, the Akia Cloud ID, it comes by default with um, some nice thing, which is the X debug, right? So the moment you need to debug something in your code, you have to do literally nothing and you can just click on the breakpoints and like magic, you automatically have, well, you have to run a command, but it's as simple as that, right? The times I've tried to configure PSP Storm with um, Xdebug has taken me some time. I guess with Thea on my remote, it will be the same. I will need to spend some time because you have to connect things, right? You have to connect Xdebug on your local, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, let's, let me show you how this is working. Um, I'm gonna try this, but maybe this is too big uh, or too small for for the screen. Can everyone see this or is, is it too small? I can read that. Yeah. Good, yeah. Okay, because yeah, I'm using a, a bigger screen, so when I try to do a demo on, on full screen, I guess a bit. It's, yeah, I get complaints that <laughs> they cannot read this. So I'm going to do, as I was saying, I have the HOTS file. On my This is still my local environment, right? This is my uh, HOTS file. I'm going to use this. And then what I have is I have my uh, few sites in which I'm working. I have my playground. I have my personal site. And I have the, the IP, as you see, the IP is what I was saying before. This not, it never changes, right? Because I have it as aesthetic on, on this workstation. The only thing that changes from time to time, um, and every time you spin up a new um, Docker or a new container, probably will change, is the, the port. And that's why I have this as a comment, because I never remember which is the port I'm using on each one of these setups. So this is nice, a nice trick to remember which port I'm using, not just adding the, the site that I'm using, I'm going to use to, to connect to, but as well, which is the port that uh, the AT port or the Apache is going to, uh, to reply or to respond, right? Let's connect to this. Super simple. As I was talking, I have the uh, public keys on the server, so I don't want to remember anything because sometimes things happen and then I disconnect and I have to remember passwords. I don't want that, right? So I just want to remember the, 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 the name of the server and my name, which is easy to remember, and I connect to that. Um, okay, what things you can do? If you think about this, I'm here connected on, um, sorry, I was trying to move Windows around. I'm connected to a remote server here, but to me the experience is like I'm in my local, right? Because I'm connected via SSH and pretty much nothing has changed. I have CSH uh, in the terminal and uh, yeah, the, the experience is pretty much like what I can have in this terminal, which is the terminal which I have on my on my Mac on my MacBook. 
Um, let's move to, for example, my personal site and things I can do. This is uh, running on DDA. So if I want to do something like Andrew's ULI, again, it's the same experience that I have on my local with a massive difference that I don't know if you have noticed, but it has taken like five or six seconds. To me, in the previous setup, it was taking 30 seconds, 40 seconds, very easy. Right? And this is frustrating. This is, yeah, you just run DRAS and uh, you don't run DRAS ULI every time, right? But uh, this translates into the whole experience being much faster. If you look at this, I click on the uh, on this and uh, I, I am logged in and it's amazingly fast. And I, this is not using any fancy stuff, main cache or anything. This is my local um, personal site. It's not running anything apart of the basic cache setup. I think I even have the cache disabled. But if you look at the performance, I don't want password, I want this one. If you look up the performance of this, this is just, the workstation is lothing at this, right? It's like, just give me more. I have more than enough. I think I, at the moment, I have a couple of uh, containers running. If I try to do something crazy, like this thing, opening as many tabs as I can, and I look at what is happening on the server, this is still lothing at me. <laughs> this is like, yeah, I can do that and much more. And, and this is all open and super fast, right? Um, if I go to more um, intensive um, uh, sections on, on Drupal, and you can see here that I don't have uh, on these areas, on the admin areas, we cannot use any, any caching, right? Because Drupal cannot cache these areas. You can see that this is super fast, right? I think everyone gets the, gets the point. Um, pa -pa -pa -pa. Yeah, I didn't show PSP Storm. I'm gonna show, I think I have everything on the terminal down here, I have an explain well, no, I think it's the dev, this one. I have the folders uh, unmounted. What I normally have here is um, a script, which is super simple, that uh, it just mounts everything that I'm working on uh, very fast. I don't have to be remembering commands, although the command is super simple. And the same goes to the unmount, right? If you don't remember to do this, uh, what is going to happen is that MacBook or your MacBook is going to get annoyed. Let's call it like that. And the, the next day when you restart your computer, um, the Mac is going to think that, that this thing is still mounted. Uh, it gets a bit messy. Um, you have to, yeah, maybe you have to even remove the, the folder that gets there as a remnant of, of this, right? Uh, from the workstation, nothing happens because you have Normally, just when I finish the, the day, I click on the on the on the desktop, and everything gets unmounted. So something I could do in the future, maybe send a sign out to my MacBook to do this process of unmounting everything automatically. But then again, it's a it's a nice a nice city more than anything that uh, more than anything else. Right? Um, I'm gonna show you if I open this. Uh, at the moment, this is unmounted, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, it gets annoying to me is that if you try to make any change, and this is a drastic change, right? There is nothing on the on the folder at the moment. I'm going to do. I'm going to mount the hold. Uh, did it work? Yes. So what is going on here? Nothing is going on, right? If I reload, nothing is going on. What happens? And this is what I was talking about, SSHFS not being optimal for this. There are better solutions for this, which maybe is um, NFS or maybe it's uh, other uh, systems. Maybe uh, I will. I need to do some research and probably update the, the article with uh, these other options. But this is doesn't it, happen that much. Sorry, any questions? Sorry, Alex, it's, it's Richard. Uh, just is it... Um only in PHP Storm that you see that, or is it uh, is it global? Like, would you see that in the Finder as well? Yeah, good it? point. Because I I, think, I, I, yeah. find, I find I uh, find PHP Storm's inode reading yeah. ability really lame yeah. compared to the PHP Storm when you're running it under Linux. 
Yeah, you are right, right uh, on the spot there. So, and I think, yeah, that, that's pretty much because, you, because if at the moment you mount this, if you look at this, let's let's do a test, right? Let's mount this. Uh, why is not Ooh, mount? Uh, and then let's mount the dev. So now I don't have anything, right? PSP Storm has updated. Wow, wow, that was fast. <laughs> talking about PSP Storm. But if I do this, and if I have a look at this, this is already filled with data, right? So actually the file system is in there. It's, um, it contains all the files that I want, but uh, PSP Storm is not having a clue of what's going on, right? This is a, an extreme case where I'm mounting the whole file system, but it gets a bit annoying when you create a file from here, like this. And maybe you're creating a new module, maybe you're creating, and then it doesn't appear here, right? Um, sometimes you force it, and sometimes it works, sometimes you need a few seconds, sometimes you need a few minutes. Uh, restarting PSP Storm, fix this. And anyway, if you, hey, there you go, it's here. It took a few seconds, so yeah. It's an, an alliance, but it's, I, I've been working with this setup, and I, I can live with this. If you obviously create anything from here, Let's say you create any file. Uh, let's here, popo, a text file. What I expect that is going to be here, as you can see here. Okay. Um, ah, yes, and the thing I was talking before, and that's pretty much what I wanted to show. Uh, this is the Chrome Remote Desktop. Some people don't like using this because you are going through Google and blah, blah, right? I'm not super, there was time I was super, um, yeah, sensible about using third party service and things like that. I'm nowadays I'm more about getting the job done. I use type BNC that works, but the experience that this is giving me is, is amazing for the times that I need to use this, right? I barely use it. I don't remember the last time I used it. A part of this morning when I was preparing, I was doing a bit of rehearsal of this. Um, and the amazing thing about this is that if you are connected to Google with your account, you connect to this uh, IP, which is, uh, how is it called? Remote, Chrome Remote Desktop, uh, whatever. Chrome Remote Desktop, this one. Um, yeah, if you see you are connected from the from the browser, you can connect from an iPad. And I've used this. I've used my iPad with um, the keyboard. Use a keyboard because otherwise it's super annoying to use a Linux computer from a uh, from a touch screen. But you can pretty much connect from any any computer in the world. It will only require your credentials on Google. And then again, it will ask for your credentials on this computer, right? I'm not sure about the security of this. I'm trusting Google on this, and I don't have a lot of things that worries me in terms of what I'm doing here is not most of the time sensible in terms of what I have in database, et cetera, et cetera. It's a stripped of sensible data, as everyone should have anywhere in your local. But if you look at this, this is, this is as close as it gets to, uh, why is it not opening? Oops, there you go. For some reason, this is not happening. Yeah, this is as close as I as you can get to a remote window experience. One thing I really enjoyed, and it took me a lot of time on Type PNC to configure, is the uh, resolution. If you move this thing, <laughs> it takes the resolution automatically and it adapts to anything that you are throwing at this thing, right? Look at this. Try to work with this resolution. <laughs> so yeah, pretty amazing. Um, some people may not be happy to hand over this level of power to, to Google. I don't just use that much um, uh, or at all. But yeah, for example, as I was saying, you could even use PSP Storm here, or you could use Spotify and connect it via Bluetooth, because at the end I'm still inside my uh, local network, right? So Bluetooth is is here, it's on my uh, next to me. If you have a speaker or, or, or a cable, you can potentially. I'm loading PSP Stone. 
Yeah, it's a bit more it's still happy. It's a, complaining a bit more. You can see on the server, and that's why there you go. And that's why, on my case, I don't like PSP Storm on the remote because of the same reason. When you have to copy, you get confused suddenly when you have to iterate between windows, right? So I prefer to have everything local. If your remote, if your local laptop have forced this, but yeah, this is an option. Yeah, it's, it's a slower than, for example, many other setup, but it's much faster than what it was before I changed this computer, right? Before I changed the, the three years old uh, laptop that I have. Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to show. Yeah, what I will do now is I will I could throw more RAM at this if I, for example, you can see that this is struggling a little bit to to open to open this, but this is actually this is probably a question of throwing more processor um, power, right? And I have this option with this workstation if I ever want to use um, this this setup, right? Like having this on 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 this kind of uh, remote ID, uh, yeah, the CID probably will be more sensible. And that's pretty much. Um, before we jump on questions, uh, this article is on alexmoreno.net. If anyone wants to have a look at the some of the things I've been talking, I need to use this because I don't remember the IP, the, the name, the URL, sorry. Uh, everything is here in terms of how you set up, how you, it's, it's a long article. Things I want to do is I want to add an index here and it would be much easier for anyone to read this. And the other one I want to, the other thing I want to mention, on the beginning I was talking about the activities that we are trying to do on the Drupal Association. And some of the things why I think I'm a good candidate, uh, I want to make the Drupal Association more independent, right? And things that we do, we did. And not everyone is happy about that, and I totally understand this. Uh, we opened the Drupal spreadsheet, a spreadsheet, sorry for my accent. But you can buy amazing swag from here, which is going to uh, some of the benefits go to the Drupal Association. Um, as I was saying, some people were not happy, and I totally get it because we are using a third party service. But some of the things that we had in the past or that Drupal Association, and that was the, the some of the first meeting that we were having with Rachel and some of the people in the association is that when they tried to do this in the past, they end up wasting more ma money than the money that we were getting, right? With this thing, we are able to send to India, to US, to we are sending pretty much to any part of the world, Australia, and it's not costing us any money at all, any any effort in from volunteers. We don't have to have anything on a warehouse. Everything is configured for. Everything is taken care of uh, by spreadsheets, right? So, but anyway, I totally get that some people is not happy about this. And that's the point, right? We do iterations. This was a first iteration. In the future, we have to think if this is sustainable moving to a, um, another source like hosting in, hosting in Drupal itself, right? I think I took a little bit more time than I was entitled to. I hope it's fine. <laughs> You're entitled to as much time as you wanted to open the object. Well, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions in the room now? Is everyone already sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still awake, that's for sure. I have a question, Dave. Um, Tell me, Dave. <laughs> um, with um, D-Dev and Lando, do they play okay together? If you've got it running on the same machine? It's not, I, I wouldn't be necessarily specific to that separate machine, but you, as you brought up, that you switch yeah. between VirtualBox, Vagrant, Lando, D-Dev. Yeah. The only problem is I had is uh, the ports, because if they try to use the same port, obviously, they are going to crash. Yeah. Uh, but because you have to anyway configure, and that's why you have the etc hosts file with the command, use this port, because it also tells me when I try to add a new service, suddenly I see, OK, I am really using this port. OK, go back, change it before I some, suddenly something is not working, and I don't understand why. So a part of that, I've right. been running both of them and actually also with Drupal VM and they can all coexist pretty pretty well. Isn't there isn't 
Lando quite opinionated about what versions of things you need to have to be running it. I can't remember what it is now. It's too late in the day. Yeah. But... I've had problems in my local, in, in Mac, in my Mac, but not on this one. I haven't updated a lot, but at, at the, so far I haven't found incompatibilities like Lando asking for this local version and then DDEV asking for a completely different version, right? So far. Right. right. And that will be a problem, actually, because you wouldn't be able to be jumping between them unless mm -hmm. you want to spend time um, changing between versions, right? Which I guess mm -hmm. you could do with some um, Ansible wizardry, like yeah, some having some scripts where you change versions quickly. Because again, you don't want to spend a lot of time every time you have to jump between projects having to configure your, your local, right? You want to do things fast and not just for, for your local, for your environment, but yeah. also for things like jumping between between uh, different projects. Okay. Good to know. I'm seriously considering doing just what you've done. It's a compelling, com compelling argument having another machine like that set up nearby. I do have a net top box that's about 12 years old with two gig of RAM and a Celeron processor in it. But that's, I set that up a few months back for, as a, 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 a Minecraft server for me and the grandkids. So the grandkids can play, <laughs> do Minecraft from. Yeah, we can play that will be the same box. option as using the Nook, right? Or something with yeah. uh, resource, uh, a little bit more tight on the resources. Yeah. Um, you could do that. What I will do is uh, what I was explaining on the beginning, just install something super basic that just gives you a terminal and then put only the services that you want because otherwise the experience is going to be worse than having your local, yeah. your local no, setup. There's no way this net top box is going to be used for any work stuff. It's just Minecraft, but it's, it's made me think if I got one, quite a beefy one, beefy lap, uh, desk, you know, tower machine like you've got, I could use that as a Minecraft server and work server at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, to be fair, this was a kind of a fun project to me. I was looking for an excuse to, to buy a, a workstation and I could justify to my wife. <laughs> and it was a, it's a fun experience. You learn, right? You always learn. And the, for example, using the Raspberry, it would be an amazing to, again, to uh, configure the other side. How do you deploy this to production? And again, Jeff Gerling has a lot of documentation on this. And he has ended up being a, a specialist on, on this. And I guess this is the point about all of this, right? You are finding solutions for problems that you have, but at the same time, you are learning a lot, right? That's good. Yeah, if you want to work in DevOps, it's great thing to do. Like one of the guys from Anatech, he actually rents a server from OVH and he does exactly what you're doing, but from that server in OVH. So have you ever considered using a server rather than your local desktop? Yeah. Uh, one of the options I was talking on the beginning is uh, it's exactly that. Like uh, you have to consider all the options. And one option, for example, would be, let me share my screen again, would be use something like AWS or something like that, right? You, you're talking about that, right? About uh, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're here. Gosh, so something like this, right? Well, he's, he's got like a 12 year old laptop. So it was like, rather than buy a new laptop, yeah. he's going to pay 30 euros a month for a server. Yeah. And it's always going to be there and fast enough. Yeah. And when you don't yeah. want it, you can just cancel it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And yeah, and it's, it's more flexible because of that. Because you know, I think the only after you are using this for 12 months or something like that, if you buy the machine, um, it gets pretty much paid, right? You don't have to continue paying for that. Uh, but you don't have in two years maybe to to rebuild the machine because it gets old. What do you do with that? You put it on the bin. Right? So maybe it's a more sensible uh, way. Uh, or, yeah. The other thing is in terms of cost, if you want to have the performance, what this beast is giving me, you, you probably have to spend a little bit more than five or 10 pounds on the basic okay. AWS subscription, right? But yeah, and the other thing they have to be careful is that uh, the services that you're exposing, the, the containers, they are not designed for this. They are not designed to, to be shared on the internet. They are de designed to be hosted on your local and used in your local. Uh, you can have some security 
uh, issues or exposing that to the internet, right? Maybe you can put some things around having a tunnel, as I said, and only allowing your computer to connect. So. Yeah, he, he does have um, it locked down brick tightly, but I think the, the, the killer for me doing it that way, it would always be like the amount of RAM in disk space because you never have enough space. Like we work in support, so there, there's literally like nearly a hundred Drupal 8 sites now. And it's just, when, when the security update came out yesterday, it was just like, oh my God. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's interesting. An interesting approach. What, what's the volume like um, sound wise? Does it, is, is it a quiet machine, the one you've got? Yeah, it's, it's quiet. Everyone 10 years ago used to say that it's quiet. Nowadays, <laughs> I, I hear the thum, the hum, right? But this is not super annoying. I mean, um, and you get yours. The, the only, for example, the only thing it gets really hot. Now I'm like, yeah, I normally have the windows open, and we are in England. It's not that hot, but this heat, this thing. If I leave it um, up, uh, started during the night, tomorrow tomorrow morning my bedroom is uh, this office is going to be like 30 degrees something like that. And in winter, this is pretty nice because I don't have to spend money on heating. Well, I spend a lot more money on electricity. <laughs> yeah. But I come to yeah seven eight in the morning to my office and it's like ah oh, nice. <laughs> but you don't really have to have it in the room you're in, do you? Because like my brother has a home server and he has it in the attic. So yeah, no, no, no. I switch it, it off every morning. Yeah. So it's not oh really, yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. an issue if you put it in another room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, good point. One thing I was thinking is I was thinking about putting this on the on the dining room where I have the router. Um, yeah, the, if it gets really annoying, the noise, uh, it could do that. Um, and then because it's connected via cable, uh, it doesn't matter because actually the connection probably here is going to the router and then coming back here. So if anything, it's going to be faster because it doesn't have to come back here, right? But anyways, it's just uh, yeah, a small difference that is not going to be a huge difference. The, the huge difference would be the, the noise, but again, it's not super annoying. You get used. It's super hot now. That you don't get that used. <laughs> Some about twenty years ago, uh, this uh, client, ex client of mine, had uh, gone bust. It was a pre press house, and they had loads of all kinds of crazy equipment. And they had this Sun Spark that they probably paid twenty five grand for or something, and they were just chucking it in the bin. So I said, I'll have that. And so I had it set up in my house and I had all the, the Solaris discs and everything is, you know, pre sun, pre Oracle purchase, I guess. And um, um, yeah, I, I used it just for that. I was noodling around with it. And I had a great big CRT screen with it as well, which I ended up getting rid of because that generated even more heat. It was very loud, uh, but I, I did connect up, but I had it, on the same network and was um, um, had uh, X11 uh, X Windows sessions into it as well, using it for my Mac for noodling around just to keep up, keep my Unix skills up to date and stuff. So, yeah, these guys were pretty That's pioneers on that, right? I, I mm -hmm. had one on my on my university on my we had a lab and we had these machines. The the desktop. Um, Terminals were pretty, pretty slick. They were pretty, mm. pretty beautiful. But these guys were ten years ahead of their time. I mean, nowadays everyone is talking about the cloud, and this actually was the cloud, like yeah. having a computer there and everyone connected yeah. to the terminal. Mm. So that was a yeah, pretty good idea, but a bit early. I ended up, I brought it when we brought it with me to Wolverhampton when we moved here, seventeen years ago or whatever, and and I just never got around to using. It. I stuck it on eBay. A starting bit of 99p and some guy in Worcester bid 99p and no one else did so he came to pick it up <laughs> and gave me a pound coin and I gave him a penny back <laughs> so so it, it's, considering I got it for free it cost you know uh, it was the reverse order for me compared to everybody else uh, yeah, to well, you're group. saving you're saving the time and the effort on putting this somewhere else right mm giving you a service at the end. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
I remember my first speaking. work experience uh, been taken into the server room and said, there you go, build this some server, will you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Different days. Cool. Thank you very, thank you very much, everyone. If, uh... well, yeah. Thank you, Alex. It's been uh, really interesting. Thank you for inviting me, and yes, uh, I hope uh, uh, everyone found it interesting and useful, maybe. <laughs> well, you can always tell just by the conversation that goes after the talk, really. There's been plenty of that. I think it's uh, it's an underutilized possibility for people because everyone's just like, I'm going to buy a new laptop that costs two thousand pounds. Yeah. And unless you're a contractor and you're trying to avoid paying your taxes, then you really want to hold on to your money. Yeah, and for one thousand pounds, this is fun to do, right? If you like to tinker, and I was missing this. I've been using Mac computers for work, and they always give me Mac computers because I, they, they work well, right? I'm happy with that. But I was missing tinkering a little bit with my beginnings were on Linux, right? And I was missing that side. So yeah, playing with this it was uh, more of fun excuse, uh, yeah, to have some fun. And now it's uh, I'm super happy with the setup. It's fast and. I'm efficient as much as myself can be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you've, uh, you've got a bargain. Did you go pick the machine up when you got it off eBay? No, I, I found it in Amazon and they sent it to me and they even give me, I think it's 12 months warranty. So <laughs> even, though, even though these things are old, you can find them wow. refurbished and there are people, because probably they find them pretty much for free, right? So they put a bit of effort, they install Windows, I didn't want any of that. But thank you very much. Um, I will keep it on a partition and maybe I will put an extra processor and start gaming. Why not? But yeah. It's quite a good little business for these companies, actually. I spent 25 years working in this industry, in the computer hardware industry. And there are disposal companies that get called in by, you know, big companies that are maybe just having a, a complete IT upgrade, getting rid of all of the uh, PCs, workstations, and because of the the recycling laws and so on, uh, it's quite strict rules now about what you can do. These companies get paid to take the stuff away, and then they kind of refurbish it and then get paid for selling it when they put it on eBay or wherever they sell it. It's uh, been going on a long time, and there's lots and lots and lots of cheap hardware out there. Yeah, this company looks super professional. They sent me this in a massive <laughs> box, everything quite well, quite, uh, yes, like very safe. And they gave me a car, they gave me uh, the, the insurance, the, the, the 12 months warranty, and they gave me even seven days to return for free. So, yeah, the experience was pretty, pretty good for, for a 10 years old computer. <laughs> um, this time, uh, normally, uh, we sort of do questions and answers or if anybody's got any problems or anything like that. Um, I know I have, I've always got those, but <laughs> does anybody else have any issues or questions that they want to raise currently? Right. right. <laughs> we're, all, we're all rock stars. Right. Well, well not me. Only you who has issues. Not me. Not me. Explain <laughs> this to me, team. <laughs> So I thought the recording now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got uh, I've got some of my sites I've got on like cheap budget shared hosting, um, and I just I don't know nothing ever goes wrong there. It's fine. Um, and then I've got two VPSs, one of which has got thirty Drupal seven sites and it's just it's a four gigabyte memory vps with two cpus and again it just gives me no headaches at all it just works everything's fine and then i've got another vps which has got all drupal eight sites on it about the same number about 30. and it's just a constant headache you know i'm about to uh, well, I started 
with a, the same spec, four gigabyte, two cores. And it was forever running out of memory. So I doubled it. So it's like a, an eight gigabyte memory, four core thing now. The core, the, the CPUs are not even sweating. They, are, they just don't even wake up. But it's just eating through memory. I'm always hitting seven, eight megabytes, often going, sorry, gigabytes, often going into swap as well. Um, what's going on? What's taking all the memory? I know, well, I know the answer to that. I know it's SQL that's taking all the memory, MySQL, sorry. Um, but why? Are you running Chrome? I'm running because, Chrome, yeah, but these VPSs aren't. Because if you don't run Chrome every day or so against your uh, the Drupal, what is going to happen is going to oh. start growing the, the SQL. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misheard you. I thought you said you're running Chrome. <laughs> no, yes, no, 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 Chrome, Chrome, Chrome. Like the rest of Sorry, the it happens to me every time with my accent. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, every site's got a, a cron job taking place every hour. I, I like to okay. keep them pretty uh, up to date for search indexing and that kind of thing. So Maybe Chrome, you're running it too often. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I, I will normally run it every day. And if you, if you need it more often, it's because uh, there is a, a reason for that, because you have a service which needs to get updated or something like that. But if it's the case, I will run something like Alicia, Cron, or something, which is more granular. But running 30-something sites, Crons, on every hour, it can, it can get pretty busy. Okay. I don't know uh, if it's the well, problem. I don't know if it's the problem. I, I, I run Cron from the server itself rather than running any Drupal processes. Uh, oh, so, I, so those are just visits to the site in a way, aren't they? Well, not really. From well, the background well, activity but, and tasks like site maps and stuff like that, you'll be sending out to Google. And I guess the question is, how busy are these sites, and are people adding lots of content to them? They're not busy sites, you know. These are mainly school websites. You know, a busy month is like a thousand unique visitors. Um, they're not busy sites at all. Uh, I've got far too many modules installed. I'm looking to reduce that. Um, but still, I'm just maxing out on memory all the time. Make, make, make sure. Is your database growing too much? or Because I've had these problems in the past, and it was because I was not clean up, cleaning up. Uh, often and things like cron you're probably running cron as you say but maybe there is something that you are missing maybe i will have a look at the databases if they are growing too much um, there, there was an funny. issue that i don't know if it's fixed yet where revisions would be cached and it kept growing and growing exponentially we had to go in and manually start just clearing out those specific tables and getting rid of some of the revisions because it just got crazy. I, I check which which tables are actually the biggest. So how would I do that? Look at a particular site and just see which tables are, yeah. Yeah, which okay. table has the most entries. Which tables are the biggest, yeah. Yeah, and then compare it with the other sites and see if there's a pattern. Right. Because if it's one thing that's happening to all your sites, it's it's probably something going wrong somewhere. Well, it will be. They're all clones, so they're all exactly the same. So, yeah, if there's, if, if there's one thing wrong with one site, there's going to be one thing yeah. wrong with every site. Uh, there was an issue with revisions and caching that we had to manually fix, I remember. So it could be that you've not got that. And I don't even know if it's in core yet. So... All right, I'll have a look at that. And that, 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 that might kick in whether, I mean, you can't disable revisions as such, but on my sites, I don't let anybody use them. So the, the, no revisions are actually taking place as such. Uh, apart, yeah, from, all right. uh, apart from when a yeah. page gets edited, obviously, and revisions create a page, isn't it? But, I just also shared, Paul, this uh, MySQL tuner, tuner Perl script by this guy at, who used to or maybe still does work at Rackspace. Okay, yeah. Um, and it's I found it quite valuable to on a 
longer running MySQL running server to, to run that on a regular basis and then just look at its recommendations and change one item at a time. And basically it's like change, change one thing a day and see how, you know, see how that works. That, or, that sounds like you're volunteering to do a talk, Richard. <laughs> it it, it sounds you, you you think that but you would be wrong <laughs> so I, I haven't i haven't used i haven't had to do any mysql tuning in about six years so i don't i'm very rusty in it well i i, I certainly need to uh, figure out where Things are running away from you there. It's, um, if everything's built the same, spin up one locally and just use the valve to just pull it and just do it until it starts acting weird and then just inspect all the database tables and everything. I, I don't know much about Devel, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I've used it for like content generation. Somebody, yeah, I was asking the same question of somebody else the other day and they said, take a look at the web profiler module in Devel to sort of see how many queries are being loaded and what have you. But kind of outside of a, a views environment, if I'm honest, I don't really understand what queries are with a Drupal site. It's basically how many times you're in the database. Yeah, it shouldn't be any really if it's cached, unless you're logged in. Well, Even um, then. I'm fully, I'm, the sites are all fully cached from the front end, although I'm not using Varnish on the server, although I could. Um, but yeah, I mean, fully cached in terms of page cache, in terms of big pipe, in terms of views caching, um, page cache module, and, you know, all, all, all the sort of onboard caching is in is in place. We but tried still... getting a um, free trial oh. of New Relic. Uh, I can get that with the. Um, the, the, the hosting service that I use do offer the uh, free integration with the, the free version. I have looked at New Relic, but you know, it's just like looking at a computer game. I didn't know what was going on, really. It'll but, do like it's, um, it'll show you any long running functions so you could at least track it to a function and it'll do front end and server, stuff. right? Okay, so it might give you some clues what's burning resources. Then. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. amazing. I, we used to use that at BBC and we used it as well at, at Akia. And every time something was crashing, uh, you could follow the whole trace of that. You don't need, even need to. Yeah, you normally go to the logs, and but this thing, it was telling you, look, it has broken, and uh, this is what is going on, and this is the, the whole trace. So it's really, really, it was really cool. Yeah, it'll show you a diagram of like. A big, pro, a big function tree, and you can like click through it to right to the end. Okay, all right, I'll look at that. All right, well, that's helpful. Thank you. Sorry, I'm gonna have to, to jump, or I'm going to get in trouble with my wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me that. Yeah, got you. Thank you very much well, for, thank, for inviting me. Thank you me. once again, and um, we're at the same time every month. We're the uh, what was it, the third or the fourth? Is it the third or the fourth, was it? Third, 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 yeah. So please join us again. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do. Next time with a beer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. See bye you. Bye. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody see that now in the chat about flyover camp? Yeah, what is that exactly? It's a, it's a Drupal camp that's happening right now. As in? in Kansas. But they're doing it on Hopin, which is the, um, I think I showed you when the DrupalCon global conference was on. They used Hopin, uh, which is really, really good. So if anybody can't sleep. <laughs> what, what time does that run to and from? I think it started about an hour ago and it's ongoing, probably, probably going on for a day. So if it was... Or well, maybe a couple of hours ago. Kansas, what's that? That's like Eastern, isn't it? Eastern time? It's that yeah, no, it's cent yeah. cent central time, it's six hours difference. Oh, it's central, right. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know, so... Six hours. Uh, they're six hours behind. Yeah. 
the early afternoon, so probably still a bit going on there, I would have thought. It's, two, it's 12 after 2 in the afternoon there. Okay. And I think if it's the Kansas City, I think. Interesting, although it's called Kansas City, I think it's in Missouri. Okay. But I'm being pedantic. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> My... uh, we've got 120 attendees, and when I last looked, a few, well, before we started tonight, really. And um, I don't know, quite a lot of presentations. I think they've got four tracks going on presentations, so four things going on at any, any one time. Um, nice. Is there anything on automatic testing you might start with, please? You'll just have to dive over and have a look, I don't know. Oh, uh, with it. Just, just sign up, it's fine. <laughs> it's what? Just sign up, it's fine, it's free. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm in, I'm in there now. It's good. It's good. Well, I said this is the same thing with the use of DrupalCon Global, and um, I thought that was brilliant, actually. In, in a way, I was, I was a bit more engaged with it than I was at a, a, a sort of a physical Drupal conference, really. I seem to meet and talk with more people. I think it pushed people to initiate conversations you know, because no one was going to randomly just have one. People made an effort. I think the, the networking feature where you just, it's just like speed dating. You just click on the networking button and, you know. So well, you like Drupal? <laughs> and then you just end up talking to some random Drupal person somewhere in the world for three minutes. It is, it is brilliant, actually. Really good. So anyway, that's on. That's on for a, a few more hours yet. Anyway, I might. Uh, as a matter of fact, actually, I mentioned earlier on um, the smart date guy. He's doing a, a talk there tonight. There was a camp a couple of weeks back that they did a talk on. It was really good. Like smart date looked really promising. I tell you what, I've just I've just uh, put smart date on a a website that I run called. You might want to look it up. It's it's the Clark Foley Centre. Um, in Ilkley, uh, Clark with an E, Foley, E-Y. And I've just upgraded them with Smart Day and, and full calendar view. And it's just absolutely brilliant. It's just absolutely super, um, just works really, really well. Like double click on the calendar to create an event from the front end. I mean, drag and drop events from the front end on the calendar and it reschedules everything, changes the times, the lot. It's just oh, fantastic. Kansas City is the largest city in Missouri by population and area. I always uh, didn't know that. I thought St. Louis was. <laughs> Never been. <laughs> You're, I don't think you're missing much. <laughs> I had an aunt that used to live uh, a few miles outside of Kansas City in a town called Peculiar. Peculiar. Peculiar, Missouri. Yeah. I remember visiting a place in uh, a village in New Zealand called Paradise, <laughs> which was. Okay. Which really was actually <laughs> nothing there, but it was paradise. So, have you got anything else? Is there any uh, any questions? Any discussion? Anything else? Don't forget the security practice on this day. Sorry, Philip. You. I really quiet. So don't forget the security practice from last night. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Drupal uh, core. Yeah. Seven and eight and nine. <laughs> oh, it's seven as well. Yeah, kept us busy today. All right, and we're turn recording off. What? Whenever.